Good morning. Let's take a moment to breathe deeply. Drink in the presence of God as you continue to breathe deeply. Listen to the silence. God is here. Turn your hearts inward. Reflect on all that God has done for you, for your family, for this church. Respond with a prayer of thanksgiving. Let us come and worship God together. Praise to the Lord the Almighty. God of abundance and mercy, we acknowledge your presence among us today. 
open our eyes to see the path before us, deepen our faith to walk with you upon this path, strengthen our hearts with courage to embark on the journey, enlarge our hearts with gratitude for your provision along the way. Teach us these things today, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray as he taught, saying, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, come thy will, will be done, done on, on earth as it is in heaven. heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Psalm 119, only verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp to guide my feet, and a light for my path. I have suffered much, O Lord. Restore my life again, as you promised. Lord, accept my offering of grace and teach me your revelation. My life constantly hangs in the balance, but I will not stop obeying your instructions. Your laws are my treasure. They are my heart's delight. You may be seated. <coughs> As you can see on the screen that our pastor profile today, our biography, is for our 15th pastor, serving from 1884 to 1889, the Reverend Lewis Atherton Pope. Um, he was born in Brookline, Massachusetts in October of 1852 or 1853, the son of Charles Pope and Elizabeth Nelson Bogman. And he died uh, August 20th, 1902 or 1903 uh, in Newburyport, Massachusetts, where he is buried. He was ordained August 31st, 1877. And uh, the next month, uh, actually a few days later, September 4th, 1877, he married Imogene Titus, in Providence. She was born in 1850, December 31st of 1850, and died March 12, 1942. She's the daughter of James H. Titus and Miranda Pierce. They had four or five children, depending upon uh, how you uh, interpret what uh, is available in uh, searches and, and genealogy information. Their first was uh, Born in 1878, Robert Anderson Pope in Mansfield, Mass. Uh, their second, Atherton Leeson Pope, or Lucen Pope, born in 1879 in Mansfield, and he died uh, in 1883 at the age of four in Warwick. Their third, Arthur Upham Pope, was born in February of 1881 in Phoenix, Rhode Island. He died. September 3rd, 1969, in Shiraz, Iran. He married a woman by the name of Phyllis Ackerman. Uh, he was very well known. He was uh, a, a professor at Brown University. He was an art critic of uh, Middle Eastern art, a very well-known person. Uh, their fourth, Elizabeth Bogman Pope, was born in July of 1885 in Warren. And their last, born in 1893, uh, died May 31st, 1893 in Newburyport. Now, Lewis entered school in Harvard, at Harvard, Harvard in 1869. But because he had, was sick because he, of an illness, he left during his freshman year and traveled visiting the Pacific coast. He re-enrolled in school in September of 1871 in, at Brown and graduated in 1874, receiving an A.B. degree. 
and he prepared for the ministry at the Newton Theological Institute and graduated in 1877. So 1877 was a very busy year for him. It's when he graduated theological school, it's, it's when he was ordained and when he got married. He served in Mansfield, Mass. from 1877 to 1879, in Phoenix, Rhode Island from 1880 to 1884, in Warren from 1884 to 1889, and in Newburyport from 1889 to 1901, uh, until the time of his uh, sickness before he, shortly before he passed away uh, from the results of a stroke. Uh, when he resigned from Warren, the church was reluctant to let him go. They had a vote and they asked him to stay and he said, no, I can't. I need to follow God's will in my life and accept uh, the call to Newburyport. And um, he served there as 11 years before he got sick, the second longest pastorate that that church had. Uh, George, uh, Pastor George Minor, uh, uh, who was serving the, the Newburyport Church in 1905, said that Reverend Pope had a lingering illness of paralysis for three years. Um, he resigned when it was determined he had no hope of recovery. He was 50 years old when he died, and uh, Minor also said to him, no one who had ever served the church put more heart and life into his work than Mr. Pope. He was vigorous, energetic, impulsive, generous by nature, no limit of devotion to his work. He had unbounded sympathy and a spirit of hopefulness that his life was full of helpfulness to the poor and the unfortunate. The house of worship was renovated at considerable considerable expense, and he raised the money to pay for the indebtedness. He was much accomplished in his uh, pastorate. Um, among those accomplish were, accomplishments were improvement of, in the vestry and the development of a method of syst systematic giving and the compiling of a church manual in 1886. Those were things that happened while he was here. And he also, uh, when he was in Newburyport, founded the Newburyport Choral Union. Now, the piece de resistance. He is Esther's sixth cousin, six times removed. There you go. <laughs> the Reverend Louis Atherton Pope. I would like to direct your attention to the north side, the fourth window back. Can you see anything different there? It's foggy. it's foggy because we have the window from downstairs is up in front of that second. So we have airflow today that we probably none of you in your life have experienced here. Let's see who's the, the Ginny. Do you ever remember the windows being able to be opened? No. So all of you who are the same age, but you, were, you grew up here. The others didn't grow up here. So the men at the men's breakfast worked on that yesterday as well as a few other things so that we could have airflow within our church. I would like to remind you that if you have not filled out a church directory form, there are some in the narthex that we are trying to keep our, our directory up to date. And if you could fill that sheet out and give it to Kevin, myself, or even have it put uh, by one of the worship and growth people into the white basket so that it can get to the office, it would be very helpful. We also have our banquet meal. If you signed up early, you need to give us one that says what you're going to eat. If you have not signed up yet, uh, we'd like you to do that. Our cookout will be held on Sunday, yeah, Saturday the 19th. I, I looked ahead to the next day. Children's Day has been postponed again. We will have it on August 24th. Uh, our special speaker will be Navy Lieutenant, Lieutenant, correct? Johnny Cazot. 
uh, also Sunday school teacher, but I put the, because we were planning to have a Navy chaplain speak that Sunday, and that hasn't uh, come about, so we're going to have a Navy doctor do it instead. Uh, and the governing board meeting will be Monday at 7 in the Jarrah building, Monday the 21st, so not, not tomorrow. I have tomorrow to do the agenda, or this week to do the agenda. Are there any other announcements this morning? Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and lentil stew. Esau ate the meal, then he got up and left. He showed contempt for the rights as firstborn. If the ushers would come forward and receive our morning tithes and offerings. giver of all good gifts. You have blessed us with so much, yet all of that pales by comparison with the knowledge that you claim us as your children, as heirs, our divine birthright. Too often we have overlooked or ignored that gift. As we present our tithes and offerings to you this morning, help us to freely let go of all we possess and that possesses us and hold fast to the birthright that is our greatest gift. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us sing together Hymn of Promise.
In the bulb there is a flower, in the seed an apple tree, in cocoons a hidden promise, butterflies will soon be free. In the cold and snow of winter, there's a spring that waits to be unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. There's a song in every silence, seeking word and melody. There's a dawn in every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. From the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity. In our death a resurrection, at the last a victory, unrevealed until its season, something God alone can see. I would also like to remind you that G20 will be here this afternoon for their concert. Michael, would you like to say something about G20? All I can say is, please tell me because they're probably one of the most amazing vocal groups you've ever heard. Uh, the Rock Club, and I, I have a little bit in it because I've got a lot of free heavy metal, but just an amazing group. They've won a lot of awards uh, throughout the East Coast, some national awards. So please, if you could, come support them. Our scripture reading today is from Romans 8, 1 through 11. Two, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our, of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could, do, could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just, so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature Think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death, but leading, letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. But the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit, if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of God living in them do not belong to him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, and just as God raised free of Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you.
We come before you in prayer, loving creator, and ask that you would help us to create with you. As we humble ourselves before you, we thank you for the seeds of faith you have planted in us when we were yet little children. We thank you for Sunday school teachers, preachers, choir directors, and parents who encourage the growth of your word in us. Grant us the courage to release the things in our life which choke us and prevent us from growth. You know what hinders us, loving God. Make us aware of the debris of our lives and help us to clear a pathway for you. In those now uncluttered spaces, Help us to fill up with your strength. Nourish us with your gift of communion that we might be able to give to others your patience, your hope, and your love, that others too might grow and be freed from the weeds that stifle their lives. We offer our gratitude that out of the gift of your grace, you have allowed us to flourish in spite of ourselves and granted us a place always at your table, regardless of the load we carry and our own feelings of unworthiness. In this, the middle of summer, some of us are ready to give up because it's too hot, too windy, or too uncomfortable, and we confess we would rather stop growing and giving and just rest in the shade. Keep us mindful, O oh God, that you do not call us to be cool and comfortable, but rather hot and bothered by the needs of the weary world. How grateful we are that you are always present to us. Let us now be present to you that we might be fed and nourished and therefore able to be present to others. We lift before you this morning, George, who will be having his knee replacement surgery this week. We lift before you Ken Cody and Brenda Boynton with cancer. We lift before you Joyce Andrzejewski in hospice in Providence. We pray that you would be with her and her family during this time of pending departure. We lift before you, Gina. We pray that you would bring healing to her life. We pray all of this in the name of the one who came that we might know what a life of love looks like, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Let us sing together, give thanks. Because of what? 
done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks. Give thanks. With a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ his Son. Now let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am rich, because of what the Lord has done for us. Give thanks with a grateful heart, give thanks to the Holy One, give thanks because he's given Jesus Christ, his Son, give thanks, give thanks. Our scripture text this morning is found in Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9. Later that same day, Jesus left the house and sat beside the lake. A large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat there and taught as the people stood on the shore. He told them many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen. A farmer went out to plant some seeds. As he scattered them across his field, some seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. My 4th of July rain cold is not completely over. Mary Poppins, Indiana Jones, Hamlet, Tom Sawyer, Ebenezer Scrooge, Jane Eyre, Elma Gantry, Madame Bovary, Sherlock Holmes, Tom Joy, Atticus Finch, Holden Caulfield. How many of you recognize those names? What do they have in common? Although they're famous, none of them are real except in the pages of literature. They're fictional characters. This doesn't mean they're not influential characters. It only means that they never really lived like the sower in today's lesson. Time Magazine did a, sur well, I'll explain it later, about the most significant person who ever lived. Numero uno in all of human history. Who is it? You know. The answer you're thinking is the correct one. Who is the most important person who lived on earth? 
Jesus, okay. When Time Magazine tackled this question, they used a computer to aggregate aggregate millions of traces of opinions the way Google ranks web pages. The top results were not terribly surprising. One, Jesus. Two, Napoleon. Three, Mohammed. Four, William Shakespeare. Five, Abraham Lincoln. Going down the list got a bit more controversial. For example, Ronald Reagan at 32 beat out Apostle Paul at 34, and they both crushed St. Peter at 65. For our Presbyterian family, John Calvin is 99 out of 100. All of these folks are real people, of course, but who would be among the 100 most influential people who never lived? People who never took a breath except in the pages of fiction. Time Magazine produced a book about these folks as well. Some of them are better known to us than actual historical figures. Sherlock Holmes, Wonder Woman, Ebenezer Scrooge, Betty Crocker, Don Quixote, Rosie the Riveter, Captain Ahab, Mary Poppins, Indiana Jones, Romeo, and Juliet. All influential, all very significant, but none of them had a life. They only got a fictional life because someone created them, fiction. You know their impact. Without such figures, we couldn't speak of a man having an Oedipus co complex or the Peter Pan syndrome. We couldn't describe women as Cinderella or Madame Bovary. We couldn't say we were afraid of government being Big Brother or science producing Dr. Frankenstein's monster. Our lives are richer because of these people who never lived. The Bible contains quite a few of these characters as well. The prodigal son comes to mind, but the sower, or as we read this morning, the farmer, is another fictional character created by Jesus, one of the most significant figures from his wide-ranging collection of parables. And unlike a cultural character such as the Marlboro Man, the sower has spiritual depth. No one else comes close except for perhaps the Good Samaritan and the father of the prodigal son. People are included, not surprisingly, in Time's top 100 of people who never lived. Jesus faces a large crowd of admirers by the Sea of Galilee, so large that he has to step back and then he teaches from a boat while the people stand on the beach. And if you want to stand the rest of this service, they stood, crowded shoulder to shoulder, listening to Jesus. Matthew reports to us that he tells them many things in parables. Such stories do more than communicate information. They engage people, bringing them in, sometimes delight and move them, and always force them to dig beneath the surface to understand what is being said. In his reflection on the parable of the prodigal son in the time book, sports writer Sean Gregory notes that the story is so simple, so direct, a piece of literature that sparks your imagination. So is your imagination ready to work? Listen, says Jesus, a sower went out to sow. We can visualize the sower in the field, and as we do so, our imaginations are sparked. And as he sowed, some seed fell on the path. Birds came and ate them up. Notice that the sower is just tossing the seed. He's not digging holes and then covering the seeds with dirt. When some seeds hit the path and are gobbled up by the birds, he just keeps on sowing. Other seed fell on rocky ground, says Jesus. Where did they, 
where they did not have much soil, they sprang up quickly, since there was no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. The sower does not seem to care where the seed goes, throwing it on completely inhospitable, rocky ground. Not surprisingly, those seeds do scorch and die. But the sword just keeps on moving, and Jesus said, other seeds fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. Finally, as we just read, a few of the seeds hit good soil, and voila, they bring forth grain in enormous quantities. What strikes you immediately about the character of the sower? He seems a bit careless, doesn't he? Just putting seed out there doesn't care where it lands. Professor of New Testament theology, theology, Donald Jewell, says the farmer in our story is not overly cautious. He throws seed everywhere, apparently confident that there will be a harvest in spite of the losses. He simply keeps sowing his seed, believing that growth will come. So what does a sower tell you about Jesus? This influential person who never lived has something to teach us about the most significant person who ever lived. Jesus is not cautious about where he preaches and on whom he invests his time. Jesus simply keeps sowing the word of the kingdom of God, even though it lands on religious people who wonder if he's possessed, on disciples who struggle to understand him, and on at least one rich young man who could not part with his possessions in order to follow Jesus. The sower keeps sowing, and Jesus keeps spreading the word. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. Jessica, can you back that up for just a moment? In many ways, Jesus is like Atticus Finch one of the top fictional characters in history, the hero of Harper Lee's novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus surpasses the assessment of his daughter, Scout. In the opening pages of the book, she says that she and her brother, Jem, found our father rather, rather satisfactory. In fact, he's much more than satisfactory. He's wise, patient, forgiving, and even brave. Time editor David von Dreil says that Atticus is the one man who will do what is right when the world says he's wrong. Atticus is a white lawyer who defends a black man in a racist southern town. As a character in the novel, as a character in the novel says to Scout and Jem, there are some men in this world who were born to do unpleasant jobs for us. Your father's one of them. Atticus stands up for justice when we would be much easier to tell the standards, to let the standards of the community prevail, and yet he isn't alienated from those neighbors with different standards. Writes von Dreil, he loves his backward, racist, fearful community, even as his heart breaks over its shortcomings. Wise, patient, forgiving, and brave. A man to do unpleasant jobs for us, and who loves us completely, even as his heart breaks over our shortcomings. Who does that sound like to you? It was Atticus in the book. But that's how Jesus works with us. 
The parable of the sower teaches us that Jesus throws good seed everywhere, knowing that most of it is going to be destroyed. And as followers of Jesus, we should be doing ministry and mission in the same way. Perhaps the same careless abandon should characterize the church's ministry, suggests Donald Jewell. Speaking gracious words without carefully calculating the potential for success. This means welcoming others as Jesus has welcomed us and preaching a message of unconditional love and unlimited grace. Do you know that every time you put someone down that you may be moving that person farther and farther away from the kingdom of God? Jesus calls us to be faithful to him and to the kingdom of God, not to be successful in a worldly sense, not to have other people think well of us, but to be doing God's word. But there is more to this parable. When Jesus explains the meaning of the story to his disciples, the focus suddenly shifts from the sower to the soil. In fact, you could even call it the parable of four kinds of soil. When the emphasis is on the soil, the message is that we should all be good soil. People who hear the word of the kingdom of God and understand it. Jesus promises that the person who does so bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. When you hear the words of the kingdom, don't be like the path which is susceptible to the evil one who comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. Don't be the rocky ground in which the plant has no root and endures only for a very short while. And don't be thorny soil in which the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. In other words, don't be Don Draper, another of the 100 most influential people who ever lived. This madman protagonist illustrates perfectly the dark side of worldly success. But here is the problem with the parable of the four kinds of soil. Soil is completely passive. It simply sits and receives the word. It cannot choose on its own to be good or choose to be bad. It takes the farmer to prepare the soil. Are you a farmer or sower today? If you saw a farmer ordering his field to be good soil, you would think that he was a little bit off his rocker. So what is it that Jesus commands us to do? In a word, listen. Then he follows that by listen and understand. Don't let the word go through and out the other side as you listen. Ruminate on it in your mind until you can understand. Listen is what Jesus says at the beginning of the parable, and it's served something that we can do as active rather than passive disciples. Listen to the story of the sower and learn that Jesus is incredibly generous in the way that he shares the word of the kingdom with all people of the world. Listen and learn that God's word is incredibly fruitful, that a great harvest is guaranteed. Listen and learn that the coming of the kingdom of God isn't something that we can control. Instead, everything depends on what God will do. In our adult class today, we knew the depression, the despair that comes when you're at the end of the rope. But we saw Jesus step in and make a difference, lifting this despair, throwing it away. The sower reveals to us that Jesus is in charge, spreading the word of the kingdom. Our job is to trust what he is doing and share his message with joy and with generosity. If we do, we'll be feeling the influence of the person 
who never lived, the sower, will also be following a savior who really lived and died and then rose to be with us forever. Today, he can still come to us, whether we're depressed, at the end of our rope, or any stage along the way, and make a difference in our lives. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you with grateful hearts for all that you have done for us for all that you have done for your people, that you call us your children. You have given us a birthright. Give us the strength and your courage to share the news of our birthright. Let people know that we are your children let people know that they can also be your children, that you will be present with them any moment that they are willing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let us sing together, pass it on. My friends, go forth from this place nourished by the gifts of God's love through Christ our Lord. So loved and so nourished, may we love and nurture others so that the kingdom of God may come. Amen. Amen.